I want you to look at a passage in the Bible in 2 Timothy, if you would, please. It's in the second chapter. Remember, this is the last thing the Apostle Paul wrote. He penned this under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. And he's following a long line of example that's been given to him. No doubt. He says here in chapter 2, verse 1, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangled himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. We'll talk for a little while about being able to teach others also. And in particular, about teaching people how to win other people to the Lord. Now, I want to repeat to you that some people have a hard time using the expression winning people to the Lord. In reality, we understand it's a work of the Holy Spirit. Salvation is of the Lord. But the Bible does say he that winneth souls is wise, right? So we should be persuasive. We should be confident in Christ and giving the gospel to people. And this is is God's way of getting it done. No doubt about it. You remember the Lord Jesus was moved with compassion and he said, pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth labors into his harvest. That's what Jesus said. And the truth of the matter is, if anyone is in the Lord's work laboring for the Lord, and which all of us would say, I'd like to be in the Lord's work laboring for the Lord, We're there because someone prayed for laborers. We're the answer to someone's prayer. In Mark chapter 3, you remember when Jesus called disciples. He called them to be with him and then send them forth to preach. We're so concerned about geography and where we're going to go and what we're going to do, we've forgotten why we're doing it. And we're to do it for the Lord. And serve him for him. Anything less than God for our goal in life is the wrong goal. We've made a goal out of a byproduct if we don't give the Lord his rightful place. We serve God for God. And if you could ever get that, if it ever gets hold of you, if you're ever captured by Christ in that way, meaning, you know, that the love of Christ is really what constrains you, your life will never be the same. I like to think that the signature of this school and our training is that one thing, that we do what we do for the Lord Jesus Christ. I've said often, and I want you to understand what this means, we serve God because of, not in order to. In other words, I'm not trying to catch up all the time. I want to be a better Christian, don't you? I want to be more effective in the Lord's work. After preaching more than 40 years, I want to be a better preacher. And I want to do whatever is necessary to do that. But I want to do all I do for the right motive because of what Christ has done for me. Our love to the Lord is a responding love. We love him because he first loved us. Now, We're dealing with some very important things, so important that I personally think God's work cannot be done without these things. So I want you to make note of it, would you please? First, there's a principle that we consider, a principle. Let's talk about that. Anywhere you find the Lord's work being done in a way that pleases God, this principle is an operation. The Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy and he said, as uh, as the Apostle Paul, he's writing Timothy, and he said, Timothy, you are to find faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. So look what you have here. You have Paul, you have Timothy, you have faithful men and others. You have four levels there. I want you to think of that in a way 
Perhaps you ought to write it down. Paul, Timothy, under Paul, write Timothy. Under Timothy, write faithful men. And under faithful men, write others also. Now, this is what we saw in, in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, this same principle. Yes, Christ came and bled and died for our sins. Praise God. He became a man without ceasing to be God. He became sin for us. He who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. But how did we come to know about the Lord? Let me ask you that. How did you come to know about the Lord? How did you come to know about the Lord? We could say, and, and, and in all honesty, Jesus told us of himself, no doubt about that, in the person of the Holy Spirit witnessing through someone, but he used a human instrument to do it, didn't he? It may have been a parent, a friend, a soul winner, a pastor, but he used a human instrument. Now, through the centuries, that's the principle of God's work. There's no doubt about that. Though the Lord Jesus Christ bled and died, was buried and rose from the dead, and offers salvation full, free, and forever to those who repent of their sin and by faith trust Him as Savior, He uses someone to tell us, you're a Christian, if you're a Christian, and I'm a Christian because Someone told us. And there's a link in that chain. This is your turn to be that link. What happens if you don't become that link? What happens? What happens if you say that you're not, you're not going to follow through with this? Let me put it to you this way. What if every medical doctor committed to healing decided they're going to get out of healing and all the doctors were just trying to make everybody sick, giving disease to people? What if every police officer became a criminal? What are you going to do about that? The point I'm making is Christians have a responsibility. Every Christian has a responsibility. The responsibility is to tell what he or she knows to talk about the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I remember the first time anyone ever trained me, helped me understand how to tell people about salvation. It wasn't a preacher, it was a layman by the name of Walter Kennan. And Mr. Kennan was a used car salesman from Union, Tennessee, and he came into East Tennessee and was having a, what we call a layman-led revival. I've always been impressed about what men can do for God and what women can do for God, not just the preacher, but what the lay people can do for God simply because of what God did in my heart out of that meeting. That's the thing that helped me catch fire. I found out the most important thing in the Christian life. Would you like to know what it is? And once you find it out, your life will never be the same. This is what I found out. I consider this to be the most important thing in the Christian life. Would you like to hear it? God could use me. I, I just have never gotten over that. I don't deserve it. I did not earn it. I don't merit it. But I found out God could use me. I could truly labor together with God. And I have two fine sons and the three of us have done lots of things together. I have a wonderful wife and, and uh, she and I have done lots of things together and we've enjoyed doing those things together. But I'm talking about I discovered that I could personally do things together with God. That God would labor with me and I could labor with God. We could be laborers together with God. That was an amazing thing to see the Lord using me. And I, I remember that as a, as a personal witness and giving my testimony. And I thought, what does it mean to give a testimony? We've talked about that. My life before knowing Christ, how I came to know the Lord Jesus as my personal Savior, what Christ means to me now that I'm a Christian. And I speak about knowing Christ in a way 
that the hearer can understand how he or she can come to know the Lord Jesus as Savior. And we don't do that in a preachy kind of way. We do that in a conversational kind of way. And so conversationally, what we do, we talk about the Lord and we talk about how, how to know the Lord, how I came to know the Lord, how you come to know the Lord, how others can come to know the Lord. And we use common denominator things about how we prayed and trusted Christ as Savior. We explain how we repented of our sin and how God forgave us our sin and the Lord Jesus Christ came to live in us. I learned that God could use me. Now let's talk about that just a moment. Please, I say, let's push that just a minute. We talk about having a burden. Do you have any kind of burden for anything? I mean in the Christian sense. Do you have any kind of burden for any group of people? The burden is, 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 is like this. We want to see the Lord break through in this. I'd like to see God or I'm burdened to see God work in these lives or in this situation or in this church or in this person's life. Someone for whom I care, I want to see the Lord break through in that person's life. Then here's the amazing thing. God can use me. He can use me. That's the principle we're talking about. Not just getting everything in line and all your ducks in a row, but coming to this strong conviction that God can use you to influence people toward the Lord. And uh, that is most amazing to me. When the Lord called people to himself, and that's what he did, he called them to himself as followers. They were learners. That's what the disciple word means. They became apostles, which means a sent one. You're learning, and now you're sent to tell what you know. You never stop learning. You never stop being a disciple, and you're always being at the feet of Jesus learning, but you're sent now. God desires to use you. And then what happens? You train others. It's not enough that you do everything yourself. That's not the way God intended for it. Even back in Deuteronomy chapter 6 of the Old Testament, God said to his ancient people Israel, he said, in the family, this is what you should do. The father should know the Lord. The father should tell the son, and the son should tell his son which is the son's son, the grandson of the father. Three generations. And every time you complete the third generation, the principle continues. It doesn't continue until you complete that third generation. And that's the same thing in principle Paul was talking about when he said, Paul, Timothy, faithful men, others. Then Timothy became Paul. The faithful men became Timothy, and the others became faithful men, and they reached others. Then the whole process again. Jesus, the Lord Jesus, his disciples, and then they reached others. You see what I'm getting at? And that's what we gotta do. I was talking to a man about a great church recently. It's a, it was a great church, but it's now almost no more. And he said to me, I, I'd like to tell you what I think happened there. And of course, I'm all ears because I'm very interested. I think it was a wise man I was listening to. And so I said, tell me, what do you think? He said, they didn't get to the next generation. If you looked at the church, there were people, all people, older people, and there was no second and third generation getting it. I think I told you, I was on a plane the other day with a, a young lady sitting beside me who was a seminary graduate. And she's from this area. And I tell you, I was impressed. She and her husband are working in what we call a denominational church in Texas. And they've just really, really pushed this whole thing of having a contemporary service. And it's divided the older people from the younger people. It's just split the church. So here's this young seminarian. She goes to the pastor. And she says to the pastor, Isn't there a principle in the Bible that God has instructed us that one generation is to mentor or help the next generation? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Then she said, now this this girl's just in her mid-20s. Then she said, then how could you believe that you're doing the right thing here? Now, she's saying to the right person, the pastor, how do you believe you're doing the right thing here when you've completely divided one generation from another? They don't see one another 
They don't worship in the same meeting. They're never encountering one another. They never have an opportunity to mentor one another. How can you believe God could be in that? You know, she made a great point. She made a great point. And I want you to get this principle. Now, the principle, you're going to first think the principle is, it's just about getting everybody lined up. We've got a Paul and a Timothy and faithful men and others. But the real truth here is your personal discovery that God can use you. That's the real truth. Once that happens, believe me, sister, believe me, brother, you won't be the same. My pastor, Brother Hagen, helped me. He encouraged me. <laughs> he, he, he just got me started right. God bless him. I, I'm going to write down someday. I've written in, in a, a cover of one of my Bibles. I, I have the same translation, the same type of Bible, but I wear them out, you know. I've retired 12 or 14 of them, but the, uh, I have in one of those Bibles the things I was just thinking one day of all the things that I think he taught me, and I ran out of space. But he, he, he spent the time teaching me. Even, even Paul, listen to this. When Paul wrote to Timothy, he said to Timothy, uh, after all the things that Paul had been involved in, in chapter 3 of 2 Timothy, in verse 10 he says, Thou hast fully known, and he lists these things in a list that Timothy has fully known. He says, Thou hast fully known these things. In other words, Paul spent enough personal time with Timothy that he taught him these things to the extent he could say, you now fully know these things. Isn't that amazing? That's why you say, well, you're the president of the college and you're the pastor of the church and you're a busy guy. You know why I'm in here? Because I want to influence you. Now, that may mean more to some of you than others. And I hope it means something special to all of you. But... It means more to me than you could ever imagine for me to have this opportunity to try to bring you along in a way God has brought me along by using others to influence me. You see? You are the faithful men and women that I'm trying to influence because I have been influenced. Now that's the principle. The second thing we need to look at is there's a price to pay. In the same passage, he says, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And in this warfare, we don't get entangled with the things of this world. Some people never make it to the battle. If we were all in uniform and we were all enlisted as soldiers, and we are, but we don't quite get there sometimes. Some of you, some of you would never be highly decorated. Some of you would never be engaged in the fight. Some of you would be in the back somewhere talking and yapping about something of, of, of no consequence because you've never, never understood that it's your turn to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. How do you think you got saved? Don't you feel like you owe a debt? Paul wrote to Roman, before he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation of everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also the Greek. Before he said that, he said, I am a debtor to all men. I owe everybody. Well, I would think that most people would have, have, have the idea that they owed a lot to Paul. But Paul said just the opposite. I'm a debtor to all men. Because I have the truth, I owe the truth. Now I want you to put your, put your heart to attention just for a moment. Has God himself dealt with you and you know you've discovered something that's true? Has he? Has he? then that makes you a debtor. You owe that to other people. That's just the way it is. And whatever it takes to get the message out there. 
Lord, help us. We've got to get it done. You know, in our Christian Heritage Center on the campus of Crown College, I, I determined that we would include as many things as we could about martyrs. Someday I'd like for you just to take the tour of the martyrs that are here, just to sort of whet your appetite for the fact that thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people have given their life for the cause of Christ. Young people, teenagers, expectant mothers, old men and women. There are stories, there are stories in that Christian Heritage Center about people who, who were going to be burned at the stake and one man went in and burned his foot off, burned his foot, watched his foot roast so he would think, he said, I'm afraid I might flinch in the fire and dishonor the Lord. I want to make sure I won't. So he went and stuck his foot in the fire and burned his foot completely off, roasted it off, and then hobbled out to be burned at the stake. Or one of my favorites, Lady Jane Grey, 16 years old, nine-day queen of England, 16 years old, who would not recant her faith, who would not deny her faith, rather, and she gave her life, saying, I want it to be known that I am dying as a true Christian. Fox wrote his book of martyrs because of the death of that young girl. I said recently to our church, most of you have an abridged copy of Fox's Book of Martyrs, but there's really, I think, eight large volumes. It looks like the Encyclopedia Britannica uh, of, of martyrs, and you can go through and find, it, it's in a, in a chronological way, who was martyred at this particular time and place all the way through. I'd like to show you that sometime. People, people through the centuries have endured hardness as good soldiers, so you and I could have what we have today. Now look, what will those coming after us have? Will they just have casual Christianity? We're talking about training people, taking people with us, being actively involved in winning people to Christ, and taking other people and training them. That's not an easy task, but is it worthwhile? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And then there's a person to please. That's the third thing. Would you write it down? This brings it all down to what really matters, that we may please him who has called us to be a soldier. So the whole work is about pleasing the Lord Jesus Christ. Does this please the Lord? Do I have God's approval in this? Am I doing this God's way? You know... I don't think about myself the way other people think about me. And uh, I'm, I'm glad God helped me. There may be people who think very highly of me. I know I'm a sinner saved by grace. There may be people who don't think so well of me at all. And I don't want to be dragged down by their opinions. But I want to know this. Am I pleasing the Lord with my life? Am I doing what Christ has given me to do? It's not just answering to him someday. It's answering to the Lord every day. Every day. That I may please him. Would you agree with me? He is a wonderful savior. And our great desire should be the desire to please him. Would you agree with me? Does he mean that to you? That you want to please him? Then if telling people about him pleases him, we should be doing that. If training other people to tell people about him pleases him, that's what we should be doing. You see, someone could teach you how to win souls and you may become effective as a witness. But there's nothing better you can do than to train others to do the same thing. And may God help us. That's how this is propagated, this truth of the gospel from one generation to the next. We're to teach others also. I'm praying for you that God will help us. There are ways to do that. We're going to talk about some of those ways and give illustrations of it. But I want, but I want you to be praying much about it.